الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ويعسك الله سبحانه وتعالى that he grants us tawfiq and success and he makes the people of aqeedah and sunnah that he keeps us upon the correct manhaj until we meet him likewise we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he overlooks for us our mistakes and he elevates our status in his firdaus walillahi alhamd we've completed the first book in this module aqeedah module uh, as part of the essentials course uh, the second book which is part of the same module aqeedah module we are going to be looking at the book Al-Aqeerah Al-Tahawiyah. Now this book is an extremely important book and we'll be covering this inshallah uh, for the rest of this academic year which I believe ends before Ramadan. So you can imagine now that this book will be a study uh, for an extensive period of time. I believe it's something like 30 weeks or something like that uh, with breaks etc. Uh, this is because this book is a really important book. And inshallah, you will see why it's important and who the author is and what the book is about in today's introduction. So if you've not got the book, you can get the book inshallah for next week because we're not going to start the book today. Today is just more of an introduction as to what the book is about and who the author is. But I believe the book is available in English. Is it? Is it available in English? You've got it? Was it published by? UK Islamic Academy. Excellent. How many pages is it? Uh, the English, 20, pages. 20 pages. So you can see here that the book itself isn't very extensive. And if you wanted, you could probably go over it in a day. But the ulama have explained Akhir Tahawiyah. Some of them have done it very briefly, and some of them have done it medium, and some of them have done it very extensive to the extent that some of the explanations go into hundreds of lectures. But obviously we've got 30 and we will be able to inshallah cover it and you will see like I said today in today's introduction you will see why it's important. So who is the author? The author is Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Sulama al-Azdi from the Yemeni tribe. So he comes from Yemen and he is known as Abu Jafar al-Tahawi but his actual full name is Ahmed <coughs> excuse me, Ahmed ibn Muhammad al-Azdi. He lived and he settled in Egypt and he was born in 239 after Hijrah. 239 after Hijrah. And he passed away in 321. This makes him from the very end of the generation of the Salaf. So now here we are studying a book from the time of the Salaf. And he lived amongst the likes of Imam al-Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari in Baghdad, Abu Zur'a, Abu Hatim and others. So he was amongst the time of the Salaf. And he wrote his book in Aqeedah. And like I said, I think this is probably one of the most extensive books in Aqeedah from that generation. His teachers, he had a number of teachers. And from the most important of them was a person called Abu, Abdul Ghani al rifaa Now Abdul Ghani al rifaa was a student of Sufyan ibn Uyayna and ibn Wahb. Now I'm sure you've heard of the names Sufyan ibn Uyayna and ibn Wahb. Abdul Ghani al rifaa is their student and then he's the teacher of our Shaykh here, Imam al-Tahawi. Another one of his teachers is Harun ibn Sa'id. Now Harun ibn Sa'id was one of the direct students of Imam Shafi'i. So when we are picking this up, we can actually now see that Abu Jafar al-Tahawi, he is close to the four Imams. There's only that one generation between them. Uh, another one of his teachers is Yunus ibn Abdul Ala. And he is the student of Nu'aym ibn Hamad. Now Nu'aym ibn Hamad is the teacher of Imam Bukhari. So Yunus ibn Abdul Ala is on the same level of Imam Bukhari. He was the teacher of Abu Jafar al-Tahari. Now there's one interesting um, incident that happens with one of his teachers. 
Abu Ibrahim al Muzani. Abu Ibrahim al Muzani. Now, Abu Ibrahim al Muzani is the student of Imam al Shafi. But Abu Ibrahim al Muzani is also related to Abu Ja'far al Tahawi. He's his mom's brother. Abu Ibrahim al Muzani is Imam al Tahawi's mom's brother. Now, he used to study at length with Abu Ibrahim al Muzani. But they used to debate a lot. So now, they're all from the Shafi Madhab, and they used to debate a lot. And one day, Al-Muzani got upset with Imam Al-Tahawi, and he said, Wallahi, la ja'a min kashay. Nothing has come from you, meaning you've not achieved anything in your life. What are you, it's just a waste. Because of the fact that they kept arguing over something. After that argument took place, Abu Jafar Al-Tahawi then left the Shafi'i Madhab, and then he studied Hanafi fiqh under a person called Ibn Abi Imran until he became an imam in the Hanafi madhab because of an argument that happened. Ibn Abi Imran says about Abu Jafar, Rahimullah about Ibrahim, may Allah have mercy on Al Muzani about Ibrahim because he swore by Allah that this man has not achieved anything. So Ibn Abi Imran later on says, May Allah have mercy on Abu Ibrahim al-Muzani. If he saw what Abu Jafar al-Tahawi has become, he would have then expiated for the fact that he said, Wallahi, this person is not going to achieve anything in his life. Because Abu Jafar al-Tahawi became an imam. Whilst in Egypt also, alhamdulillah, whilst in Egypt also, he has exchanges with other Hanafi scholars. Now this is important for us to understand when it comes to how to understand madhabs. There's one Hanafi position. Abu Jafar al-Tahawi did not take the Hanafi position on a particular mas'ala. So that Hanafi scholar says to Abu Jafar al-Tahawi, why do you follow Abu Hanifa in this? Are you not a Hanafi? So Abu Jafar al-Tahawi says, yes, walakin la uqalliduh. Yeah, I am Hanafi, but that doesn't mean I blindly follow Abu Hanifa. Then he said something which remains famous with the ulama, especially with the ulama in Egypt. La yuqallid illa muta'asibun aw ghabi. Nobody blindly follows. What do we mean by blind following? Meaning you take an opinion of someone not necessarily even a scholar, you take an opinion of someone without any evidence for it. That's called blind following. So if you ask a person, why do you pray in the way that you pray? You say, I don't know, I've just been taught that way. That's blind following, because you don't know why you're doing it. When you've got dalil, and when you have studied, then you are not making taqlid anymore, you are not blindly following anymore. So Abu Jafar al-Tahawi said, لا يقلل إلا متعصب أو غبي. Nobody blindly follows except that if he is somebody who is a partisan to his madhab, to his group, or he is foolish, there is something wrong with him. Either way, it's something blameworthy, meaning you are only following a particular madhab or a particular school or a particular masjid or a particular person for the sake of that particular person or school or masjid or wherever it might be. That's not allowed in our religion. We have been told to follow the Qur'an and the Sunnah and do it sincerely for the sake of Allah. Therefore, blindly following is not something which is legislated in our religion. So Abu Jafar al-Tahawi said, yes, I respect Abu Hanifa, but it doesn't necessarily mean I need to blindly follow him. Nobody blindly follows except for a person who is wrongly blindly following that school for the sake of following the school. He's not really interested in the haqizi, he's following the school. Or there is something wrong with him in his understanding. He is foolish. Abu Jafar al-Tahawi then became a Qadi in Egypt. Uh, and for us to understand what that means, it means that not only has he got ilm as a scholar to be able to teach and to give fatwa, but also it means that he's got a great deal of wisdom in how to deal with the issues that people have with one another. So he becomes a Qadi because of the fact that he's got a great deal of balance in his knowledge. What have the scholars said about him? The scholars have talked about him a great deal. I'll just give you two examples here. 
Ibn Jawzi, rahimahullah, he says, Thabitun, Fahimun, Faqihun, Alimun. He is Thabit, meaning he is somebody who is uh, trustworthy, he is somebody who's got a good understanding, he is a scholar, and he is a Faqih, meaning he has a good grasp of the religion and its understanding. That's taken from Ibn Jawzi. Imam al Dhahabi describes him with even more greater praise. He says, Al Imam. Al Allama, Al Hafid al Kabir, Muhaddith al Diyar al Misriya, Faqih, and he, then he goes on. So he calls him an Imam, he calls him an Allama. Now, an Imam is somebody who is followed, and an Allama is very similar to somebody who is an Imam, except that you could say that Al Allama is probably more of a praise in the way that the person is praising. But either way, an Imam and an Allama basically means this person is to be followed in all aspects. In aqeedah, follow him. In fiqh, follow him. In mannerisms, follow him. In hadith, follow him. So this is what he is saying, Imam al-Dhahabi, about Abu Jafar al-Tahabi. He is an imam. He is al-Lama. He is al-Hafid al-Kabir. He has memorized a great deal. He is a muhaddith al-Diyar al-Misriya. He is the scholar of hadith of all of Egypt. And he is a faqih. The person who has a good understanding of fiqh, of the religion. So that's the person who authored this book. What about the book itself? Now, the book itself has been accepted with the ulama from the time it was written until the day that we live in today. And a great deal of scholars have explained this book. And the author, as we will cover, inshallah, in next week's session, himself explains what his methodology and his manhaj is. And he says that this book in Aqeedah is upon the way of what Abu Hanifa, Abu Yusuf, and Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani upon their manhaj and upon their aqeedah. I mean, you've got the Hanafi madhab, and it comes from a person called Abu Hanifa. He's got two very famous students, Abu Yusuf and Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani. So the fact that he's mentioned all of these three names who have basically formulated the Hanafi madhab in their opinions, these three individuals and their opinions that they have in fiqh and aqeedah, etc., what he is saying in the introduction, as inshallah we'll cover maybe today or next week, he is saying that this is their methodology. This is what they believed in. So that's what this book is about. And when we can understand that, we can then understand that this is the aqeerah of Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah. And like I said, it was accepted from the time when the author wrote it. And from that point onwards until today, you find the ulama giving a great deal of importance to this book. The greatest explanation, or probably the best explanation that has been given to it, is by a scholar, Ibn Abu Iz al Hanafi. Ibn Abu Iz al Hanafi. And he was in the 8th century from the same generation of Ibn Taymiyyah ibn al Qayyim. Now, he, when he explained uh, Aqeel al Tahawiyyah, he explains to us the intent of Imam al Tahawi. And he explains the intent with the methodology of Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah. Now the reason why I'm saying this is because this book that you've got here, you will find that you've got this publishing here that in front of you. I don't believe that they are Salafi. I believe that they are either Diobandi or Matrudi or Ashri or something like that. You will find different groups and different sects saying, no, Abu Jafar al-Tahawi had the same aqeedah as us and he is not Salafi. He is not Ahl sunnah he is a Ashari or he is a Matrudi or something like that. But the fact that Abu Le- Ibn Abu Aziz al Hanafi is explained the book and he is saying that this is what Abu Jafar al Tahawi intended and all of this is in line with the Akhir of Ahl Sunnah clearly shows that he was upon the methodology of the Salaf al Salih. As he has said himself in the introduction, this is the Akhir of Abu Hanifa. Ibn Abu al-Aiz al-Hanafi, I mean, we're not here to talk about him so much. I mean, we will be covering what he says in his explanation as well. But just to give us an understanding of Ibn Abu Ibn Abu al-Aiz al-Hanafi, he lived at the same time as Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn al-Qayyim. And the ulama have explained that his aqeerah and his manhaj was the same as theirs. So the very fact that Ibn Abu Aziz al-Hanafi has explained Aqeer al 
and within that he is saying that this is the Salafi Aqeedah and it's in conformance with what Ibn Taymiyyah Ibn Qayyim and our you know, ulama that you know from you know, household names from Ahl Sunnah then that clearly shows that this is the correct understanding of this book and it is upon the Sirat al-Mustaqeem wa lillahi alhamd but for us to understand now that many people from different sects, different you know, groups have taken this book and said no he is from us and he is you know, uh, you know, following their deviant way but that is definitely not the case so like I was saying here, from the time that this book was written, the ulama have given a great deal of importance throughout the ages until today you'll find explanations from Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz and Sheikh Muhammad al-Albani. Why would they explain a book if it is, you know, a deviant book? Of course it's not a deviant book, it's a book from Ahl sun Here we have a statement from Abu Ibrahim al-Raisi al-Hanafi. Now he is a person um, uh, who is from the Hanafi school, um, but he is from the contemporary Hanafis, he's from the later Hanafis. And he says, Inna jamur al-ulama talaqqa aqeel al-tahawiyya bil-qubool. All of the ulama have taken the Aqira of Imam Abu Jafar al tahawi as this is the Aqira of Ahl sunnah Nobody has rejected it. Nobody has said that this book is incorrect or there are things which are wrong in the book. This is the Aqira of Ahl sunnah Wal Jama'ah. Others from the ulama, they have said, In the Kitab al Aqaid al Ladi Rawa Abu Jafar al tahawi and Abu Hanifa wa Abu Yusuf wa Muhammad, as for this book, that Abu Jahr al tahawi has written, and he said that this is the Aqeedah of Abu Hanifa, Abu Yusuf and Muhammad, اعتمد عليه أهل السنة والجماعة سلفهم وخلفهم أهل السنة والجماعة from the time it was written, from the time of the Salaf until the later generations, all of Ahl al-Sunnah have taken Aqeedah al tahawiyah as a book in Aqeedah from Ahl al-Sunnah, namely the Aqeedah of Abu Hanifa and his students. What is Aqira al tahawiya about? What are we going to study? Inshallah, the author, the very first thing that he starts talking about and the very most important thing that a person should ever talk about is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And within that we have Rububiyyah, we have Uluhiyyah and the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But within that he talks about other things which are connected to the oneness of Allah also. Such as the Qur'an. Is the Qur'an the speech of Allah? Or is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the Qur'an and revealed it upon Muhammad sallallahu so that the Qur'an that you have is something which is created? This is something that we will be studying inshallah. In the contents of the book also, we have belief in the last day. What will happen when you enter into the grave? Intercession of the Prophet ﷺ and the angels and the believers, the scales as to where your deeds will be measured and weighed, the hold, the pool that was given to the Messenger of Allah ﷺ on the Day of Judgment, seeing Allah on the Day of Judgment, the Sirat and others that have been uh, discussed when it comes to belief in the last day. And let me just stop here before we carry on with the content. It's very important because these are the things that Ahl Sunnah believe in. And you might think, okay, well, it's pretty straightforward. I know that we're going to be questioning the grave and if you're successful, if you're not successful, certain things are going to happen. I know these things. But the issue here is, is that you will find as we go through the course, inshallah, that you've got a lot of deviant sects believing in things which are not correct when it comes to these things. And sometimes their deviancy is so subtle it might escape you. You might think, okay, well, that's fine. The way that he said it is okay, but it's actually not okay in certain things. So, for example, the Qur'an. Is it created or not, no, not created? And even to the extent that you might even find some people saying that the Qur'an is not created, but my recitation is created. Or they might say, for example, that the Qur'an is not created, but what we have is the meaning of Allah, the meaning of what Allah said. I don't know if you've heard these kind of things before, but these are some of the things that you will find 
these deviant sects believing in. Now you might think, okay, well, why is that important? You will see, inshallah, how it is important, and some of it even leads to shirk. Uh, so we've got Tawheed, we've got the last day. The third aspect of the book, we're going to be looking at Qadr, the good of it and the bad of it. What does it mean to believe in pre-decree? Iman. Now here, when it comes to Iman, now we're going to talk about this in a moment, actually. It's the next point I want to mention. Abu Jafar al-Tahawi, like we have said, he is Salafi. And this book is upon the methodology and the manhaj of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah wa Lillah al-Hamd. But as the ulama have explained, in Aqil al-Tahawi, there are certain issues which either it is wrong in the wording or it is wrong in the thing that he has said. And perfection is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that doesn't necessarily mean that if a person makes a mistake that necessarily that we take him out from Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah. Especially in the beginning where he is saying that I am upon the same aqeelah and manhaj as Abu Hanifa. And if Abu Hanifa is one of the ulama of Ahl sunnah which we will discuss in a moment because some of the people have said that he isn't, then if we are to say Abu Hanifa is one of the ulama of Ahl sunnah then we can fairly say that Abu Jafar al-Tahawi is following that same methodology and he is from Ahlul Sunnah. And if a person makes a mistake, then either we make excuses for their mistake or we, you know, if they are alive and we are able to, then we advise them. In the issue of Iman, he says certain things which could be then seen as following a way which is not the way of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And we'll give you examples of that in a moment. But the content so far, we're going to be, inshallah, talking about Tawheed. We're going to be talking about the last day. We're going to talk about Qadr. We're going to talk about Iman. We're going to be talking about the companions and the Jama'ah. Companions and the Jama'ah. Now, this is very important. Because we live in a world today where there is a lot of politics, where there is a lot of fitna, there's a lot of confusion. And people are talking about other countries and they're talking about policies of certain people, etc. It is from the Akhir of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah that we stick to the Jama'ah. And we don't create discord within the Muslim Ummah. And we don't disturb unity. And we want everyone to remain upon the same methodology which is following the Quran and Sunnah with the understanding of the Salaf al Salih to the best of our ability. And if you see oppression, if you see deviation, if you see something going wrong, there are steps that a person must take in order for those problems to be eradicated. But when we're talking about the belief of Ahl sunnah when it comes to the companions in the Jama'ah, you will see from history, as we will study, that whenever an issue occurred in the Muslim Ummah, they were very quick to start fighting one another, even if it was a companion they were fighting against. So Umar radiallahu was murdered. Uthman عن, was murdered. Ali عن, was Imagine Umar was alive today. Would anyone have in their right mind, from the Muslim Ummah, the one point something billion people, in their right mind think, I'm going to go stab Umar. I'm going to put someone up to go stab him. Umar al-Farooq, the person who was always with the Messenger of Allah How would this thing come about? It can only come about when people deviate in their aqeelah. You might argue, well, Umar was stabbed by a mushrik and he was put up to it by, you know, some you know, other mushriks, etc. Fair enough, let's put that aside then. Uthman, Uthman was killed by Muslims. Ali was killed by Muslims. And the list goes on about people who were killed by Muslim companions. Uthman, عن, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, gave him his daughter and then she passed away, he gave him his second daughter. And then when she passed away, he goes, if I had another daughter, I'd give that daughter to him as well. Uthman, Ali, عن. so now here, how can... All of this happened. How can Uthman be killed by another Muslim? How can Ali be killed? It is because the aqeelah was deviated. And if that wasn't a lesson for us then, it's definitely a lesson for us now because now there is much more confusion. There is much more fitna. So that's why this is important here. We're going to be, to, inshallah, be studying the importance of the companions and how and what it means to stick to the jama'ah. And in the contents of this book as well, we're going to be looking at the manhaj of following the Salaf al-Salih, and how to keep a balance in that, not to go into extremes and not to be too lenient. Remaining upon the Sirat al-Mustaqim, upon a balance. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَى We have made you a balanced nation, not too extreme and not too lenient. Balance, very important. Right. 
Akhir like we have said, we have been last half an hour praising this, this book, as it rightly deserves to be praised. But the ulama have mentioned, and this is only out of justice, not out of disrespect or discrediting the author, rahimahullah. They have said that there are two issues in the book, but the second issue can be split into two as well. So maybe four issues if you want. The first one is not really an issue. It's just more of a critique, which is that he repeats himself a lot. He repeats himself more than once without there being any obvious kind of need. So if a person is going to write a book in Aqeerah, this teaches us something which is important, whether it's Aqeerah or not Aqeerah. If it is a religious discussion, not even religious, you as a Muslim, you as a person who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given iman and aql and intellect, if you are going to talk about an issue, be calculated in the way that you're going to talk about it. Don't just sit there for hours repeating the same thing over again or repeating something which might even be batil and might not even be true. The ulama have said, okay, here we have a fantastic book from one of the ulama from the time of the Salaf. But then why is he repeating certain things over again? It kind of removes the fluency of the book. And that's all they are saying here. There is repetition without any kind of obvious need. Now here we learn as a benefit here. So you might think, okay, well that's... On him, it's nothing to do with me. Well, it has got something to do with every single one of us. If the ulama want for us, want for the author, want for everyone to be as precise as you can, then in that is an indication on how you should be in the way you deal with issues yourself, in your akhlaq, in your mu'amalat, in the way that you speak to one another. And obviously, when it comes to your religion, so the first sort of critique of the book is that there is a petition without any kind of obvious need. The second one though, now this is a bit more um, theological, is that he says certain things in the book that the Ashaira and the Matrudiyah will then use to say that, look, Abu Jafar Tahawi is a Ashari. For example, he says, and I'm going to say it in Arabic, then I'll translate it. وَتَعَالَىٰ عَنِ الْحُدُودِ وَالْغَايَاتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from having any limitations and any وَالْغَايَاتِ um, as in any kind of, uh, can we say, place or can we say, uh, location even والأركان والأعداء والأدوات أن الله سبحانه وتعالى is free from any limbs or any kind of um, utensils لا تحويه لا الجهاد كسائر المبتدعات and the directions cannot hold him meaning for Allah there is no north, south, east or west now what he is saying here is correct in the way that what he is saying, but not correct in the way that he is saying it. So when he is saying here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from any kind of limitations or any kind of place, that is correct. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not inside of his creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be limited by his creation. But, and then he goes on, that he doesn't have any limbs, and he doesn't have uh, any kind of directions north, south, east, west. Ahl sunnah believe in these things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above his arsh in a manner that befits his majesty. And nothing can limit Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not resembled to the creation in the slightest. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond time and space in the way that we know time and space in it being created. Inshallah, we'll talk about this in further detail later. But the Asha'ira and the Maturudiya love this because what they say is that Allah exists without a place. You've probably heard this before, I'm not sure if you've heard this before. This is what they say Allah exists without a place. The common Muslim, if you ask them where is Allah, they will probably say Allah is everywhere. This is actually worse than what the Asha'ira say. This is what the Jahmiya say, Allah is everywhere. But the Asha'ira, they say, look, we don't agree with the Jahmiya. How can Allah be everywhere? As in, is Allah on the table? Is Allah, you know, ta'ala Allah, amma yakulun lu'un kabira. There's no point in going into, you know, how disgusting that is of a statement, Allah is everywhere. 
So the Ash'ara said, we don't agree with the Jahmi in this. How can Allah be everywhere? What we will say then is Allah exists without a place. And what they're trying to do here is, is discredit the Jahmiyyah, but also use the Kalam at the same time. But then also use the text to say Allah is not separate from the creation and they try and cause a middle ground. And this is very important for us to understand and we will go into this in further detail later inshallah during the course. The Ashari Madhab came about because they wanted to fuse philosophy with text. And we did Ilm al-Kalam and Ilm al-Mantiq previously when we were doing Usul al-Thalatha. But just to revise, Ilm al-Kalam is when they use theory to support a religious or theological belief. Right. A person will say that we came from apes and monkeys and swine, whatever it might be that they say. We came out of coincidence, we came from nowhere. Someone who might say that. That is now a theory. How are you going to prove that? You will go into philosophy, might even use a bit of science, might use a bit of maths, you might, and then you will create this theory to say, look, here now, I've proven for you now here, enough evidence to say, man came from nothing. That is how Ilm al-Kalam works. And this is what the Jahmiya and the Mu'tazila and so many different sects fell into a great deal, to the extent that they said, really bad things about Allah. To the extent where you have this statement, Allah is everywhere, they, ca- they got it from Ilm al-Kalam. Ahl-Sunnah, they say, listen, we have no need for philosophy. What do we need? What do you need? To... Quran and Sunnah is sufficient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ar-Rahman al arsh istawa Allah rose above his, Ar-Rahman rose above his arsh. Khalas, do we need to stop thinking and theorizing? We say no, we follow the text and the Sahih Sunnah, and this is the understanding of the Salaf al-Salaf, this is sufficient for us. The Asha'ira came in the middle and they said, listen, you can't just completely discredit this. This is centuries old, Ilm al-Kalam. There's a lot of work that goes into it, there's a lot of thought and intellectual properties involved in that. And at the same time here, we've got revelation from Allah. There must be a way that we can bring these two together, because Aql has been given to us by Allah. How can Aql be wrong when Allah has given you the ability to think you know, and formulate, etc. So what they said is, let's fuse a new madhab and put them two together. So now, when the Asha'ira see something like this, they say, yes, fantastic. It is good. The six directions cannot hold Allah, north, south, east, west, and the other directions. But what he actually means to say here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not like the creation, he is separate from his creation and he is not limited by time and space in the way that we know time and space. Also, so now this is one of the criticisms that we have or the ulama have had for Abu Jafar al-Tahawi in the sense that he is using words which could have been clearer upon the way of Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Also, in the very beginning, actual fact, in the very first few sentences, he calls Allah Qadim. Is Allah Qadim? What does Qadim mean? Anybody? Qadim? Qadim means old. Is Allah old? Ibrahim shaking his head. Why are you shaking your head, Ibrahim? You don't have to do that. Is it deficiency? Okay, number one is deficiency, but even more important than that. Why is it that we can't call Allah Qadim? Okay, but even more important than that. Yeah. Even more important than that. Even more important than that. That's what he said. He restricted by time. Where is the evidence to say Allah is Qadim from his name and his attributes? Right. The Ashaira say Allah is Qadim. The reason why is because the Ashaira they say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did everything in eternity. And again, we will study this, inshallah. But if you say, oh Allah, have mercy on me, does Allah have mercy on you? Is it possible that if you say, oh Allah, have mercy on me, oh Allah, give me, oh Allah, help me, oh Allah, support me, oh Allah, save me, oh Allah, protect me, will Allah do that right now? If you have done what is sufficient and He 
has accepted your du'a, would Allah do that right now? Of course, this is what we believe, Ahlul Sunnah. Allah acts in a manner that befits His Majesty. The Asha'ira and those like them, they say no. Allah is Qadeem. Everything happened in eternity. He already knew that you're going to make this du'a today on a Sunday. And he already knew that he's going to accept your du'a on a Sunday. Therefore, he already decreed it in eternity. So when you say, oh Allah, have mercy on me now, they say, no, no, Allah's not going to show you mercy on you now. He knew from before. So does Allah actually show mercy? They say, no, Allah doesn't show mercy right now. Why? Because everything is Qadim. The author uses the word Qadim for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is one of the things that one of has said, you know, he doesn't mean it in the way that the Asha'ira mean it. However, it would have been better if he had left this out. Another issue, this is when it comes to names and attributes. Another issue when it comes to some of the critique, when it comes to the theology in this book, is the belief of iman and actions. He says in the book, Aqid Tahawiyah, wal iman. Iman is, huwa iqrar bil lisan, is what you testify on the tongue, wa tasdiq bil janan, and you will affirm this. In your limbs, in your state, in your actions, wal iman wahid, and iman is only one. Wa ahluhu fi aslihi sawa, and all of its people are the same. Is anything wrong in what he has just said? Iman is one, and all of it, the people of iman, are the same. Is that okay? What's wrong with it? Excellent. Excellent. So now, one of the things that the, uh, the people of deviation have fallen into is saying that Iman is one. Either you have it or you don't have it. And if you have it, it is all the same, as in everybody has the same portion of Iman. Ahl sunnah say Iman is not one. Iman varies according to your actions and your belief and your statements. If your actions, belief and statements are strong, your Iman will be higher. And if it is weak, then it is weak. And as a response to them, we will say that, okay, well, if Jibreel alayhi salam has Iman and Abu Bakr Siddiq has Iman, are their Iman the same as my Iman? You can't say that. So this is one of the things also that we find in the book. However, I mean, like we said before, uh, as a whole, this is a book which is upon the methodology of Ahl sunnah and the Aqeedah of Ahl sunnah And the way we know this, now this is very important for us to understand, this is really, really important, because a lot of people, when it comes to especially the books of the Salaf, they will put their own spin on it and say, well, the book is not authentic, or um, he didn't mean it in the way that you Salafis mean it, etc. You will find people trying to discredit Sharh al-Sunnah of Imam al-Barbahari. You will find people trying to discredit Kitab al-Ulu of al-Dhahabi. You, and the list goes on, and this is one of them as well. How do we know that now we've got this book from Abu Jahl Tahabi. Now we've got this book from Imam al Barbahari. Now you've got this book from anyone. How do you know that this book is actually a Salafi book and is not a deviant book that they're claiming? Because quite often what they will say is look, the Salafis have hijacked this book, but the author who wrote this book from the time of the Salaf doesn't believe in the same things that Ibn Taymiyyah believes and you know, the ulama from uh, the Salafi ulama today believe. How, do we, how can you, you know, debunk that? One of the biggest ways, and this is very important, is by looking at other books from the author himself or the madhab itself. Now this is important. So now we've just seen how Abu Jafar al-Tahawi has said one or two things which could indicate that he had mistakes in his aqeedah. We're not saying that he does, but let's just say for argument's sake, in Asma wa Sifat, he had mistakes. In the issue of Iman, he had mistakes. I'm categorically saying here 
that you know we are going to defend him. Even though even some of the ulama, Sheikh Al Mani said in Iman, he was off. He wasn't on the way of Ahlul Sunnah. But that doesn't necessarily mean we take him out. But anyway, let's just say for argument's sake that these people are claiming that Abu Jafar al-Tahawi had some issues. How do we know now that it isn't really as what they claim? By looking at, number one, other books that the author has written, and by looking at other books from the same madhab, which reinforce what he is saying himself. So for example, people try and ridicule the Sharh sunnah of Imam Barbahari. How do we know that Imam Barbahari actually wrote that book and that aqidah is sound, etc. Number one, by looking at the works of Imam Barbahari elsewhere, because then that will complement what he is saying here, but also by looking at the Hanbali Madhab, because he was Hanbali himself, by looking at the Hanbali Madhab, and all the other Hanbali scholars are saying the same thing. There's other books from the Hanbali um, ulama at that time, before him, after him, books of Aqeedah, and they're saying the same thing. So it's the same thing here now. If a person wants to discredit the Aqeedah of Abu Jafar al-Tahawi, will say, listen, you are wrong for one of two reasons. Number one, look at what he has said elsewhere, and then you will see whether what you are saying is correct or not, number one. But also look at the books from other ulama, from the Hanafi uh, madhab, especially from that time, and then you will see whether what you are saying is correct or not. And with this, we will then know that Ibn al-Iz, Ibn Abi al-Iz al-Hanafi, rahimahullah, when he is defending Abu Jafar al-Tahawi against the claims that people are making against him, he is doing exactly this same thing, going through the same process by saying, look, this is what he said elsewhere, or this is what our scholars have said about this, etc. That way we know that the Hanafi madhab is actually in its aqeedah, inshallah, upon the way of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. With this, and this is the last mas'ala for today in this introduction, we have to talk about something which is really important. Because I'm sure you have heard this before, uh, and if you haven't, I'm sure you'll probably hear of it at some point in your life, where people are criticizing the aqeedah of Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. To the extent that Shaykh al Albani, uh, rahimahullah, said that Abu Hanifa had irja. Now, irja basically means you detach iman from actions. There's your iman, it's in the heart. Your actions, whether you do good deeds or bad deeds, doesn't affect your iman. That is not the belief of Ahlul Sunnah. Ahlul Sunnah say that your iman is connected to your statements and your actions. Like we said before, just a moment ago. The more goodness you have, the stronger your iman. The less goodness you have, your iman will dip, it will go down. And the only way that you can make your iman go up again is by doing what? Tawbah and istighfar and doing cleanliness, you know, purifying yourself. And you will find that your iman goes up. And I think this is something we can all relate to. But the people of Irja, they say, Iman is in my heart. Only God will judge me. You can't tell me what to do. Go work on yourself and I will work on myself. Akhi, Ukhti, it's time to pray, inshallah. One of those inshallah meaning in the sense that, yeah, don't worry about it, it's not that important. I've got it inside, that's fine. This is irja, and this is from a deviant sect which comes from a very bad place. Some of the ulama have said Abu Hanifa had irja. How? We will talk about this in a moment. But he lived in a generation, and his teacher, Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman, was one of the very first people to come with this concept where a person says, listen, if you've got iman, as long as you say la ilaha illallah, you are a believer. And your good deeds doesn't necessarily affect your la ilaha illallah. That's what the Khawarij say. The Khawarij, the extremists, until today you will find them saying that if you do not work to establish a government or a khalifa or make jihad or something like that, you are an apostate, you are a munafiq and we will, you know, we will do with you as we please because your life is not sacred anymore. The reason why they say that is because they say if you are not doing actions, your la ilaha illallah is eradicated. So the Muraji are complete opposite spectrum. They will say, listen, as long as the person says la ilaha illallah, who are you to say that his la ilaha illallah has been eradicated? Ahlul Sunnah, like I said before, are balanced. 
They say there are certain things which take a person outside of Islam, such as a person abandoned in the salah. And there are certain things which are between you and Allah, such as tawbah and istighfar and tawakkul. These are things that nobody else knows. This is between you and Allah. But there are certain things in between as well. Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman was the very first one to come out with saying, listen, Iman is inside. If you do things outside or don't do things outside, it has an impact, but it's not necessarily connected to your Iman inside. And as you can imagine, when you've got something like that, which you might think, okay, it's not that big of a deal when it comes to Aqeedah and Manhaj, but when it snowballs, this is what you find today, where a person says, I can just pray Eid Salah and I'm a Muslim. How can you do that? Because I say La ilaha illallah throughout the year. I'll come to the masjid once a year. It's fine. So some of the ulama have said that, uh, this is the view of Sheikh Al-Bani and others, have said that Abu Hanifa had elements of irja in his aqeedah. It is well known that Abu uh, Abdullah al-Bukhari, Imam Bukhari, called him a jahmi. Why did he call him a jahmi? It has reached Imam al-Bukhari that Abu Hanifa was of the view that the Qur'an is created. That the Qur'an is created. Now, this issue of the Qur'an being created, I don't want to jump the gun too much because we don't have time to go for it right now anyway. But there are several issues with the Qur'an being created. Number one, (coughs) if the Qur'an is created, is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Reveal this book from his knowledge or did he create this book? Ahl sunnah say that the Qur'an is not created and it's the speech of Allah and it's from his knowledge, subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَنزَلَهُ بِعِلْمِ وَأَلَّا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he has revealed it with his knowledge and there is no God that is worthy of worship except him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, when you recite the Qur'an, it is hidayah. When you recite the Qur'an, it is nur. When you recite the Qur'an, your iman goes up. The Jahmiya say, no, no, it's just created. It's normal. It's normal created speech. It has reached Imam Bukhari that Abu Hanifa was of the view that the Qur'an is created. So Abu Imam Bukhari calls him a Jahmi. Now, this is important because... Imam al-Tahawi, rahimahullah, as we will see next week, in the introduction says, this is my akhirah, and it's the akhirah Abu Hanifa, Abu Yusuf, and Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, and it's the akhirah of Ahl-Sunnah wal-Jama'ah. So if he is saying that this is the akhirah of Ahl-Sunnah wal-Jama'ah, how is it possible that people have criticized Abu Hanifa for his akhirah and calling him a murji and a jahmi? Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, says, that Abu Hanifa was on the way of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. He was on the way of the Salaf. And he repented before he died. He was not a Murji. He was not a Jahmi. And the Mu'tazila and the Khawarij attached themselves to him. And this affected the views of other scholars about Abu Hanifa. Whereas others from the ulama, this is what Ibn Taymiyyah is saying here. Others from the ulama were not aware of the tawbah that Abu Hanifa had made. Now with this, we see a very good balance from Ibn Taymiyyah. He is not denying that he may have said certain things. But at the same time, he is saying, no, he's an imam from Ahl sunnah And his aqeedah is correct and his manhaj is correct. And if he has mistakes, then he has made tawbah. Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, said... استتيب أبو هنيفة من الكفر مرتين أبو هنيفة made mistakes more than once and he had to make tawbah more than once when it came to some of his issues we have a long statement here from Ibn Abdul Bar rahimahullah which we won't go through but he is saying here most of Ahl al-Hadith most of Ahl al-Hadith استجازوا الطعن على أبو هنيفة على أبي هنيفة they have said that Abu Hanifa's aqeerah and his manhaj is not correct. And here Ibn Abdul Bar is saying that this is the view of most of Ahl al-Hadith. What are Abu Hanifa's issues? Three issues. Number one, that the Qur'an is created. Number two, that he believed that iman and actions were separated. And number three, 
but he rejected narrations which were ahad. But what Ibn Taymiyyah said is more correct. And I'll give you an example. Khatib al-Baghdadi rahimahullah in Tariq al-Baghdad he said that Imam Ahmad rahimahullah and the Senate is here anyway Imam Ahmad was asked about Abu Hanifa is he a Jahmi or not? now you have to remember now Imam Ahmad is the teacher of Imam Bukhari Imam Bukhari called him a Jahmi he said لم يسح عندنا أن أبا Hanifa كان يقول القرآن مخلوق there is no narration. It's not been proven that Abu Hanifa used to believe that the Quran is created. His own student, Abu Yusuf, Khatib is mentioning himself, he said, Me and Abu Hanifa discussed the issue of whether the Quran is created for a period of six months. And we were studying it and studying it and studying it. Hatta qal until Abu Hanifa said, Man qal al Quran makhluk fa huwa kafir. The conclusion after six months of study is that Abu Hanifa said that anyone who says that the Quran is created, then that person is a disbeliever. What does that tell us? That tells us that he wasn't a Jahmi, rahimahullah. Ibn Abil Iz al Hanafi, when we will go through uh, Iman, he defends the idea that Abu Hanifa had al-Ilja. So it is correct for us to say that Abu Hanifa did not have al-Ilja and it is correct for us to say that Imam al-Tahabi, inshallah, followed Abu Hanifa in that. And the last issue, so now the first one is the Qur'an is created. The second one is that the issue of al-Ilja. And the third issue is rejecting narrations which I had. Now this is important because the only way can the people of deviation deviate is when they split the ahadith of the Messenger of Allah into two types. Now these two categories are fine. There's nothing wrong with the categorization. But the reason why they did it is to dismantle the aqeedah of Ahl sunnah They said, when you have a hadith from the Messenger of Allah either the hadith is mutawatir or the hadith is ahad. Mutawatir, so many people have narrated this hadith, it's impossible for this hadith to be a lie. So this hadith has to be accepted. Whereas Ahad, not many people have narrated it. Now the ulama have actually mentioned most of the hadith from the Messenger of Allah, Ahad. Sometimes he'd just be with Abu, uh, Abu Huraira and he'll say something to Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira will narrate to someone else, who narrate to someone else. So there's only one sort of chain of narration until it finally gets narrated or recorded in Bukhari or Muslim, wherever it might be. Mutawatir are typically those things that he has said in public and there's been 20, 30 people that have heard it and then they narrated it onto another 20, 30, etc. And it's impossible for all of these people to lie. But I had... There is a possibility that there's something gone wrong here somewhere. So this is what the people of deviation have done. Split the religion into two. And the reason why they want to do that is because when you have narrations about Allah, about the grave, about Yawm Al-Qiyamah, about the scales, about intercession, about, the compa- about whatever it might be, they can say, oh, well, this hadith is ahad. There is an element of doubt in it. and We can reject it. There is weakness. You can't base your aqidah on something which there is suspicion. That doesn't make sense to us. Where's the aql in that? So they will say, no, we will put a cut to that hadith and we'll depend upon our aql instead. So now you can understand why this allegation is a severe allegation against Abu Hanifa. They said Abu Hanifa used to reject ahad narrations. Ibn Taymiyyah in response, he says, وَمَنْ ذَنَّ بِأَبِي حَنِيفَ أَوْ غَيْرُهُ مِنَ عِمَّةِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ أَنَّهُمْ يَعْتَمِدُونَ مُخَالِفَةِ الْحَدِيثِ السَّحِيحِ لِقِيَاسُ غَيْرِهِ فَقَدْ أَخْطَعَ عَلَيْهِمْ Anyone who thinks that Abu Hanifa or anyone else from the ulama, from the Muslims. So now look here. He has put Abu Hanifa on the same level as the other ulama from Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah. <coughs> that they would reject narrations which are sahih. Then that person has made a mistake against them. وَتَكَلَّمْ إِمَّا بِذَنْ وَإِمَّا بِهَوَىٰ and this person is either only speaking out of guesswork 
he's just thought of something, it's just you know, an allegation, a rumor, or he is speaking from his desires. So these are the three things that they claim against Abu Hanifa. And as we have discovered, Ibn Taymiyyah and others from the ulama and from the time of the Salaf actually, have said that uh, Abu Hanifa was free from these. And that now, you know, leads us into the book where the author says, هَذَا ذِكْرٌ بَيَانْ أَقِيدَ أَهْلَ السُنَّةِ وَالْجَمَاعَةِ عَلَى مَذْهَبْ فُقَهَاءَ الْمِلَّةِ This is the aqeedah that we're going to study. From the, stu- from the aqeedah of Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah, upon the madhab of all of the fuqaha, the four madhabs, and etc. Abi Hanifa, Nu'man ibn Thabit al-Kufi, Abu Yusuf Ya'qub, Ibn Ibrahim al-Ansari, wa Abi Abdullah, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, Rudwan al-Nahi alayhim ajma'een. Uh, and then he goes on, Rahimullah. So he is saying here now, that what we will be studying, inshallah, is the aqeed of Ahl al-Sunnah. This is also the aqeed of Abu Hanifa, Abu Yusuf. Uh, Muhammad ibn Hassan and all the ulama from Ahl al-Sunnah have the same aqeedah as this and this is their manhaj also and inshallah next week we will begin with this and the first lesson inshallah we'll be talking about what is aqeedah and we'll be talking about tawheed and the oneness of Allah bi-idhnillah we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grants us tawfiq in this and that he keeps us firm upon the sirat al-mustaqim until we meet him and that wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين